Hello. I would like to talk to you about astronomical instruments in the Islamic world, specifically about astrolabes. Astronomical instruments are essential historical evidences for the development of mathematical sciences, and you can find them in the museums or private hands, or uh, you can find them, it, it was described in manuscripts uh, centuries ago. And every single instrument we can find, every single detail about our instruments, specifically the astrolabes, uh, creates uh, some sort of a, a base ground for our, our historical searches and uh, researches and developments, understanding what they were doing. And even a simple treatise on how to use an instrument can give us some what type of mathematical arguments uh, they were using in a specific region, in a specific uh, timeline, in a specific period. Uh, what some astronomical instruments are uh, not made too distinctive from, uh, for, for us to be able to understand uh, which period it was used or why it was used like that or not. Uh, because, uh, for example, with the armillary sphere uh, in the Islamic world, uh, almost always used in observatories. So when you look at this, uh, you see, a, let's say, a 13th century armillary sphere from Maragha Observatory is almost quite similar to the one 300 years later in Istanbul, in Istanbul Observatory in 16th century. And you can't actually use those kind of instruments to make a map of uh, what kind of uh, influences on astronomical instruments, astronomical activities, or what kind of influence astronomical uh, activities does to the people. Uh, so you only start seeing uh, some sort of a tradition uh, uh, following by uh, from Ptolemies to the Islamic world and in Islamic world followed exactly the same. But it's not the same for every kind of instruments and the astrolabs uh, are extremely different uh, in comparison to armillary spheres uh, to give us uh, much more information and not just astro uh, astrolabs but also a type of astrolabs derived from astrolabs, the type of instruments derived from astrolabes also have the same uh, effect on us. And the shape of a throne, uh, type of adoration, choice of latitudes uh, for observations, engravings for specific and astronomically significant uh, markings, makers' signatures, dedications, those all uh, what, is in, on an, what is on an astrolabe uh, can give us so much detail. And I'm not just talking about scientific development or anything, but also uh, the historical context, uh, what kind of a generation it was made, why they were made, why they were made in this way. Uh, it, 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 it gives us so many clues to, for us to understand uh, not just the, the scientific developments, but also uh, historical uh, problems of a specific region, like in the Islamic world, Islamic East or Islamic West, or specific region as a Mamluks or uh, the Central Asia. So uh, to give an example a little bit, uh, uh, when you start uh, researching on astrolabes, uh, you start to uh, focus on uh, the differences and the, the similarities of astrolabes, you start seeing some sort of a, a pattern on different regions. For instance, uh, the astrolabes in the Islamic West, usually on the back of the astrolabe, uh, usually carries a set of uh, tables, set of scales uh, with a Julian calendar and the zodiacal scale with corresponding to each other. And uh, you start saying this is a reasonable, uh, reasonable thing to do in that period, in that region. And because to be able to make any kind of calculations and measurements, you need to know when you're actually making the observations, the specific date corresponding to which degree or which sign of the zodiac. So it gives you, without even, even you don't even have to be an astronomer to do that, even for a simple uh, idea, a simple person who doesn't understand an astronomy, it's just a regular person uh, who could actually work on it by using that scale. Uh, so, it, and when you look at this, uh, uh, although it is quite valuable and quite fruitful to use it, quite helpful to use it, uh, you see almost always in the Islamic West, not in the Islamic East. Yes, there are some examples, but it's not a tradition that, that was followed uh, by the Islamic West, uh, by the astronomers in the Islamic West. So uh, when you see that kind of a pattern, you start to understand that there are differentiations 
And uh, these are not just uh, main ideas. Uh, it, it becomes more detailed, detailed and uh, uh, some sort of a, a distinct patterns for specific regions and, and times, of course. And when you look at that kind of thing, uh, as a person who works on uh, astronomical instruments in the Islamic world, I started to uh, map the development of uh, astronomical instruments and the differentiations in three categories, three timelines, let's say, three ages, you can say, if you want. And the first one would be the absorption period. And this always related to the, uh, quite correlated to the development of a mathematical science in the Islamic world at the same time. Because uh, in, in, from, uh, from the eighth century to the 12th centuries, there was a, a immense learning period in the Islamic world. Uh, first, they started to translate the Greek, Persian, and Indian texts into Arabic. They started to learn mathematics in different uh, different styles, and they actually combined uh, Greek uh, geometry with Indian trigonometry and to create new branches of sciences to make much more accurate calculations than ever before. So uh, with this, uh, astronomical instruments also became an understanding of uh, pushing the boundaries. Because with, the, with, an, uh, with an astrolabe, for example, uh, you don't know uh, before, no, before actually examining it, everything, every possibility in geometrically. You don't know what you can calculate and what you cannot calculate. So uh, they were trying to push all the possibilities at, the, at this period. And uh, what can we do with an astrolabe? Uh, what, how uh, extensive uh, of a use of an astrolabe? They were going for that one. And uh, to give an, another example again from the Islamic West, uh, we start seeing something in, in 10th century, uh, what we call a, a universal astrolabe. And when you, uh, when you look at the universal astrolabe, that, uh, that basically means an astrolabe that you can use in every latitude. Uh, so uh, you don't actually need a, an astrolabe in every latitude. You will never live on some of the latitudes that you can make calculations. But why would they do that? So it's not just scientific. It's also, uh, it's showing a little bit of, uh, the idea, the, the philosophy behind it in that specific region and why they were doing this in the Islamic West. Because when you think about this, the, the, the most reachable position of the Islamic Muslim Spain in that sense, uh, from the north to the uh, to north, south of the uh, west, Northwest Africa, you only have maybe 15 uh, degrees latitude uh, scale. Uh, so why would you go beyond that? Uh, so it's not just uh, because it's not just making calculations, but it's also uh, trying to understand the extent of the knowledge that could reach. So that kind of things they were going for the, in, in the absorption period, but it didn't remain that. Uh, so it was vague. It, you, you, have, you, you see so many different instruments that may not be practical, but they, they still make it for geometrical uh, purposes to understand it. But when we come to the 13th century and uh, we come to the specialization period, and in this period from 13th to 15th centuries, we start seeing uh, more accurate measurements and more uh, reasonable practical methodology uh, to create astrolabes. And uh, this comes with, uh, again, with the correspondence with a correlation with uh, the development of mathematical sciences, which diverse over time and some of the regions are more specifically focusing on some specific things like Mamluks for example uh, they were establishing the timekeeping uh, 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 knowledge of timekeeping in a sense that they can actually uh, employ astronomers for mosques in the mosques that they can actually tell the time for uh, for prayers or other practical religious needs so uh, they were focusing on, although every branch of astronomy and mathematics were studied almost er, er, all around the Islamic world, and Mamluks, which ruled uh, Egypt, Palestine, and Syria from 13th to 15th centuries, were focusing more on uh, the timekeeping. So uh, when you look at them, they try to be uh, more accurate in making astrolabes, yes, but at the same time, they are trying to be more easy to use. Um, they're trying to create more easy to use material. So they, uh, they folded up the astrolabe uh, into four uh, to create the quadrant, uh, the, uh, the, what they would say, a robot, uh, the quadrant. 
And on one face, you would see uh, very similarities of the regular astrolabe. And the other one is the back of the astrolabe, the sign graph is uh, embedded on one, uh, one object. Uh, and I can actually show it even if it's possible, uh, one of the examples that they did. And because I also make replicas of the instruments, so it could be helpful. So this is one of the examples. It, uh, I don't know if it's actually showing. And then this is another side, uh, maybe it's too shiny for just for that. But so what they were trying to do is uh, how can we make astronomy uh, reachable for everyone, not just for the elite astronomers who knows everything about astronomy in detail, but the people who has basic knowledge of astronomy and who were employed in mosques to tell the time and to find the Qibla, the direction of Mecca, or any kind of you know, mathematical formula, uh, not too complex to work with these instruments. And then they also pushed boundaries on that one as well, because they didn't remain with one simple quadrant and they tried what kind of quadrants we could make and it became entirely different over time. So uh, because of the, uh, because of the, uh, the hunger uh, for new things and uh, pushing the boundaries and creating something uh, much accurate, uh, we, have see, we, we see an immense activity of uh, instrument making in this period. And uh, it is quite accurate and one of the most beautiful, most uh, absolutely uh, fantastic working instruments still today uh, in, the, in the section of astrolabes, of course, in the museums, you can see from the 14th, 15th centuries. But it didn't remain there as well. So uh, when we come to the 17th centuries from the uh, specifically in the third period, I, I mentioned uh, what I call beautification. So at this period, we start seeing, uh, since we already managed to find out how to make accurate and uh, if, it's, if it is necessary, simple instruments, now it is time uh, to a little bit of show off. Yes, there were uh, very beautiful instruments dedicated to sultans uh, or gifted to some important person. Uh, you can see uh, shiny instruments with uh, you know, uh, silver inlays or uh, gold leaves additions and everything. But uh, when we come to this stage, uh, the 16th to 17th century, uh, we don't see a change mathematically, ge ge geometrically in the shape of the instruments. But we see every instrument we see actually getting more beautiful than ever. And they were actually focusing on the craftsmanship, artistry. And again, another example I could give uh, here is a 17th century Iranian astrolab. Uh, you can see the details here. It is absolutely mind blowing. It's so beautifully made. This is a replica, of course. This, the original is in the History of Science Museum in Oxford. But this is one of the replica I made. And even uh, with all of the uh, you know, inscriptions and uh, it's, uh, far more beautiful than anything. But you start seeing the different differences because uh, when you see that kind of a beautiful instruments, uh, it's almost always in pristine condition. They, they never use them because uh, astrolabes started to lose the, uh, the astronomical significance over time in some regions, of course. Uh, and it became like a courtly uh, gift object or you know, that, that could help you out to understand that your status is a social status, uh, having more than one astrolabe, for example, or, or the sultan who has the biggest astrolabe or uh, like that. So uh, that changed a little bit of the understanding of the scientific developments continued uh, specifically in the Ottoman Empire, uh, with the Ottoman Empire using uh, less astrolabes, but more quadrants because the practical, uh, practical applica applications were still remaining important. Uh, and uh, I can say that, uh, although there are some uh, intermittents from different regions and periods, ever since the establishment of the Office of Timekeeping in Mamluks in the 13th century, uh, until the tw uh, 20th, 20th century, uh, in 1952, which the uh, abolishment of the Office of Timekeeping in uh, uh, Turkish Republic, uh, the new Turkish Republic, in that period, almost 800 years, uh, we see non-stop observations every day. 
uh, somewhere in the Islamic world, some of the mosques continue to calculate time to tell the prayers, to tell the muezzin who calls to prayer, uh, saying this is the time for this prayer and this is the time for starting the uh, fasting month Ramadan. So it it was uh, an uh, a, an immense continuous activity and those kind of instrumentation period uh, at some level remained the same but also changed over time. So that is what I am trying to understand. And the main point here, uh, with the specifically in this kind of uh, uh, evolution of instruments, you start seeing the uh, more you work on. Uh, some regions are specifically focused on, uh, focusing on specific things. And uh, maybe very lately, we started to uh, question these things in the history of science, why? those instruments, why those mathematical formulas or those manuscripts written in a specific region and to put an understanding, uh, 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 is that possible that public were involved in scientific developments? Because uh, it's a mosque and uh, a mosque that actually is a part of a living society uh, as, a, as a religious society, as a Muslim society. So what kind of relations instruments have with the public at the time? Uh, in comparison to some of the ideas or the uh, very uh, very complex ideas that were never reaching to public, uh, astronomical instruments uh, provide us that uh, that barrier is actually not uh, too strong when it comes to uh, practical applications, and that is what I'm studying, and that is we are trying to focus on. I think that uh, should be able to wrap it up, and I would I would be able to continue if I would I will be able to continue making this. And the re making replicas is one of my uh, one of my things to understand that period because what kind of instruments they can make and what kind of materials they were using and what kind of formulas they were using uh, to understand as a as a 13th century craftsman. I try to do the same thing and it gives me so much uh, more than I can read from books and just in uh, notes on the manuscripts. Uh, and it's becoming much more uh, accurate and I hope I will be able to continue this work for a long time. Thank you very much for this. Se você gostou desse vídeo, dê um like, compartilhe. Aproveite para assinar o canal e ative as notificações.